audience wants to hear you. All right. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> okay. Very fine. Yeah. So my uh, so Christina's testing, so I'm just going to keep talking here, and hopefully she can hear you. Mm -hmm. And me talking. Okay. So to start it, it's this button right here. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. Um, the volume, this auditorium has really good volume. However, if I come up and adjust it, just ignore me. I'll oh. be quick. Um, there's a clip. You can put it in your pocket or you can uh, clip it to your belt. Um, because you're moderating, I will ask that you keep this on the entire time. But obviously, when Susan is speaking, feel free to turn it off. Yeah. But at the end, Twice. as we're going through questions, um, due to the online component, um, I've instructed Susan to either repeat the questions back mm -hmm. so the online audience can hear, um, or, uh, yeah, there is no or, just repeat right. the questions. Because <laughs> they so won't the hear you. Was, and then and on the evaluation comments, they usually complain that they can't hear yeah. the audience. So just repeat back. <clears throat> yep. um, yes, and same for you. Always keep a microphone on. So I'm going to turn it off now. It's right up. Test, 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 test. Well, I'm not. <laughs> it's almost green green. It is, I think. Oh, can I speak? <clears throat> kind of wait for somebody to say you're on or something. Thank you. 
I think it's time. Well, good afternoon. Can everyone hear me fine? Good, good. Um, I'm George McKeever. I'm a director of admissions and marketing at Calvin Community. Used to be called Calvin Manor. So it's a big retirement home here in the Beaverdale neighborhood. Uh, we're here to hear a, a series of speakers over the next seven weeks. Today, we have Susan Callison. But first, a uh, couple orders of business. Uh, I guess public restrooms are just through the doors. The ones I saw are through this door and move for peace in the central area. There's another set down this hallway of restrooms. I hope you've all received uh, your evaluation sheet and that you're all registered. You should receive the evaluation sheet when you check in. So if any, anyone here is not registered, please make a note to find us here at the door. All right. Uh, in, anyway, that evaluation sheet is important for us to get your feedback so that we, we know how to do this uh, the best way. All right. Thank you. Now, these, these uh, upcoming events are all going to happen here in this room, most of them at noon. A couple of them are at night. Uh, the ones coming up are uh, February 27th, Healthy Aging and Brain Wellness. March the 6th, Palliative Care. That's the evening one, starts at 7 p.m. right here. March 13th, Patient and Family Perspective. That would be of dementia and Alzheimer's disease. March 20th, Dealing with Family Financial Realities. Uh, March 27th will be the Emotional Challenge. And then finally, April 18th, the importance of storytelling. That one will be in the evening also, 7 p.m. Today, our speaker is Susan Callison. Susan Callison is the program specialist for the Greater Iowa Chapter of the Alzheimer's Association here. She will be sharing information regarding signs and symptoms of dementia and Alzheimer's, strategies to reduce risk on onset, and data surrounding the current state of Alzheimer's and dementia here in Iowa and the U.S. Join me now for uh, welcoming Mrs. Callison. Ms. Callison. Well, thank you very much. It's certainly my pleasure to be here and give you an overview of what is Alzheimer's and what we can do about it and the impact in Iowa and nationally. There is a tremendous amount of information that's available and so I want you to know that you can go to our website, which is alz.org, for um, more information on a variety of topics. Uh, the handout that many of you received is our Basics of Alzheimer's program. And we had a little technical challenge, so the actual PowerPoint today is a little bit different, but it's the same information. We found out this morning that that one wouldn't correlate with the technology we have, but this is the same information, so the slides aren't going to match exactly, but it's the same. And you can find that PowerPoint on our website for free, so you can um, go to that to get those specific slides. So with that, we'll go ahead and get started. So Alzheimer's disease was originally discovered by Dr. Allos Alzheimer in 1915 he was able to identify that there was something unique about one of his patients, and it was very advanced aging compared to the general population at the time. And he was able to, uh, in 1906, he actually discovered that there was something specific going on with the brain. So Alzheimer's disease is just one of the dementias. It is not a normal part of aging, and just in the last 20, 30, 40 years, we've been able to identify a lot more information than when it was originally discovered in 1906. And so what Dr. Alzheimer saw was there's normal neurons in the brain, and then the Alzheimer's neuron. There's these plaques and tangles that seem to get in the way of the communication that needs to happen with our brain. And so he identified that this was one specific disease that was causing the symptoms in this patient of very advanced aging. And yet, it's not a normal part of aging, it just looks like aging is really fast, 
aggressively um, progressing. So um, typically people don't start seeing some of the symptoms until their uh, older age, 65 or 75 or 85. However, in some rare cases, it does happen even younger. Um, so Alzheimer's is brain failure. It means the brain is not able to do its job. You know, our brain is in charge of our thinking and our behaviors, and when it can't do its job because of Alzheimer's disease or another disease that causes those challenges, then we start having those symptoms, the cognitive loss that happens. So it is irreversible, it is progressive, it's a brain disease, and it slowly destroys memory and thinking. So when the disease first starts happening, happening in the brain, it can be many, many years before the first symptom shows up, like maybe 10 years. So uh, we are having, obviously, a really hard time finding out what causes Alzheimer's disease today. There is no, uh, there's no prevention, there's no cure, absolutely, that can prevent it. However, there are some things that we can do to reduce our risk, and we're going to talk about some of those things later. So these are just some of the statistics from the national facts and figures that are available today. Today, in the United States, it is the sixth leading cause of death. There are more than five million Americans that currently are living with Alzheimer's. And because it's progressive, and because we have an aging population, by the year 2050, this number could raise as high as 16 million. And again, it's because we have an aging population, there's going to be more and more people age 65 and older by that time. And if we don't find a treatment or a cure, it's going to continue to grow. We know that there are more than 15 million people that are unpaid caregivers providing that care for Alzheimer's disease. Most of the care is happening at home. 70% of the people with Alzheimer's disease are living at home. They're not in facilities. And in those early stages, many people can live quite independently with their family and with their friends, and some of them are still living independently by themselves. And so they, are, they will, at some point, need additional assistance, but in those beginning stages, those beginning years, many people can live quite independently. The cost of Alzheimer's disease is the most expensive impact to Medicare and Medicaid today. And so we know that by the year 2050, that these costs could raise to $1.1 trillion to Medicare and Medicaid. So we're all paying for it. So we really must find a treatment or a cure. And research is making good progress, but today we don't have that evidence. Today, one in three seniors dies with Alzheimer's disease or another dementia. There's kind of a stigma associated with Alzheimer's disease. People don't really want to talk about it, and yet, if we don't talk about it, we won't eliminate that stigma. 20 and 30 years ago, people wouldn't talk about cancer. And yet, it's nobody's fault. It's not contagious. We just need to talk about it. And that will help us reduce that stigma and help us create more awareness and support to those families who are dealing with it. So it's, today, it kills more people than breast cancer and prostate cancer combined. It is a huge epidemic in our society. And right now, every 66 se seconds, somebody in the United States is diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. So these are the national statistics, and it does vary depending on where you live in the world and in the United States. So let's go ahead and look at Iowa. In Iowa, it's the fifth highest um, death rate in America. It's the sixth leading cause of death in Iowa. Right now, there are 135,000 caregivers that are unpaid family members and friends that are caring for those people with Alzheimer's, in addition to the paid caregivers that work in facilities, uh, assisted living and memory care units. It's 154 million total hours of unpaid care, which translates into a whole lot of money that is happening out there providing care and support to those families. And uh, the 93 million is the cost of higher health care costs for caregivers. We know that caregivers have a lot of strain and stress by being a 24-hour caregiver, and their health care costs are increased because of the stress and challenge of being that 24-hour caregiver. So there's a huge amount of information that could be helpful to the caregivers and those living with Alzheimer's, and so 
The Alzheimer's Association is on a mission to increase the information that's available to the general public as well as caregivers to help improve care and support to families. Right now, because there's no treatment and no cure, uh, there are some medications that can improve some of the symptoms, but they don't slow down the progression of the disease. So if we can provide education, that can help a lot. In the last 20 years, if people can learn more about how to communicate and how to deal with some of the challenges of the behaviors through education, it can actually improve the quality of life for both the caregiver and the person with the diagnosis. So that's where the Alzheimer's Association steps in and tries to help those families to provide that information. So let's get back to what is Alzheimer's. Uh, it is not curable like cancer in some cases. It's not manageable like diabetes. You know, if you get diabetes, you go to the doctor and they can provide education for how to manage diabetes and it can help you better manage that, the, the disease that you have. But if you have Alzheimer's disease, you can't stop the progression. You have to learn as a caregiver how to de deal with it. If you have Alzheimer's, it's harder for you to be able to figure out how to manage the disease. It's not reversible, it's not treatable like mental illness. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the, the, some of the terms, dementia, cognitive impairment, and Alzheimer's. That's the most common asked question I get is, what's the difference between Alzheimer's disease and dementia? Well, dementia is the symptom. So if we have a cold, you know, we have a runny nose, that's the symptom. If I have Alzheimer's disease, dementia is the symptom that is the cognitive loss. So like memory challenges or confusion with time and place, those are examples of the symptoms and it's the dementia is the symptom. So a disease would be causing those symptoms. Alzheimer's disease is just one of them. There are 80 or more different kinds of diseases that cause that dementia. Alzheimer's disease is the one that happens about 70% of the time. So it's most common. So many people use those terms interchangeably. And some people even tell me, well, my doctor told me I have dementia, but it's not Alzheimer's. So it might be a different kind, or they don't have enough information yet to give a specific kind of, or diagnosis that it might be Alzheimer's disease. I have many patients tell me they get one diagnosis and then they go back a year or two later and they've got it changed. It's a different kind. So we're learning more all the time. There are many, many different kinds of dementia or diseases that cause that dementia, but Alzheimer's disease is the one that happens about 70% of the time. So, uh, so what is co uh, mild cognitive impairment is uh, sometimes what the doctors will diagnose in the really early stages. So that means that someone might have symptoms that are severe enough to uh, notice, but not severe enough to have you need additional help around the home. So mild cognitive impairment quite often can be an early diagnosis and it may progress into Alzheimer's disease. However, not always, sometimes people never get any additional more severe diagnosis than mild cognitive impairment. And people can live pretty independently still with some help, like, uh, like being able to uh, have calendar reminders or medication reminders. Those kinds of things will help with mild cognitive impairment. So uh, dementia that is uh, part of Alzheimer's disease is permanent, it's irreversible, it certainly is destructive because it takes over our brain, so our brain can't work like it's supposed to. It's degenerative, it's brain damage, it does mean brain failure. It also means brain shrinkage. When the disease is happening to the neurons in the brain, those brain cells will actually dissipate, and so the brain will actually start to shrink. It's again very slow growing, so this happens over many, many, many years. Uh, and so, as I said, when a symptom first starts happening, uh, it could have been 10 or 20 years previous that the damage started happening in the brain. So we don't know it for a really long time. And when the first symptom shows up, people can live sometimes 10 or 20 years longer with the disease as it progresses. And so it's uh, certainly a very confusing and challenging disease. However, somebody with Alzheimer's told me recently, if you get a diagnosis, it doesn't mean your life is over. It means your life has changed, 
but it's not over. There's a lot of good living to be had, and that's what we try to do with our association is help people live well, even though they have a diagnosis like Alzheimer's disease. So uh, this is kind of gives you another example of what is dementia. Here's a few of the different kinds. Again, there might be 80 different kinds. Alzheimer's disease is the most common, but some other ones that might cause dementia might be Pick's disease or Lewy body disease, vascular dementia, or a brain tumor can cause some of those dementia symptoms. Here's another example of what that means. You know, dementia is the overall term, and there are many different kinds. So there's flowers is an overall term. There are many different kinds. So that's just kind of a, an example of how you can think about what is dementia, and it's the, all the different kinds that are, are causing the challenges with the disease. So some common irreversible causes of dementia, some other ones are uh, a multi-infarct or vascular dementia or small strokes can cause some of the dementia symptoms. Parkinson's disease sometimes have symptoms of dementia in the later stages. Lewy body disease is a, a kind of dementia where folks sometimes have trouble with very vivid dreams or they might see things, have hallucinations that aren't really there. Uh, and they typically don't have memory loss. With Alzheimer's disease, that's the most common symptom. So the symptoms are gonna be a little different, but they both are challenges with the brain not being able to do its job like it's supposed to or like it used to be able to. Frontal lobe diseases, uh, there are a variety. Pick's disease is one of them. Crutchfield-Jacobs disease. Huntington's disease is one of those that is very progressive that one is specifically genetic. With Alzheimer's disease, we can't always tell uh, by genetics whether or not somebody is gonna get Alzheimer's disease later in life. If you have a family member with Alzheimer's disease, you are at higher risk. You are more likely to get it, but not everyone will. Only 5% of the time is it genetic. With Huntington's disease, they are able to do genetic testing to, to identify whether you will get it. We also can get uh, dementia symptoms from head trauma. Again, that's many, many years later. And so when you hear even in the news about all the, the sports folks that have a lot of concussions, many of them are getting dementia many years later. Overuse of alcohol causes dementia. And so you know, we, we know that if you drink too much alcohol, you're killing brain cells. And so that eventually is gonna cause challenges with the brain being able to do what it needs to do. Uh, there are some common reversible dementias. So it's a really good idea to see a doctor if you're having trouble with memory loss or other challenges with your brain because these things are treatable. An infection like a UTI is treatable and doctors can identify uh, that that's happening and they can provide medicine to be able to fix that. Uh, some overuse of medications or complications with medications can cause some dementia symptoms. Dehydration. I have a colleague who, and a, a friend who has dementia, and he was really having a hard time, and really it looked like he was progressing very quickly in his disease. And it comes to find out he was severely dehydrated. That was treated, and he was able to get more of his cognition back. But it was a very confusing situation when he already knew he had Alzheimer's disease, and then it started progressing very quickly. So if you see sudden changes or very fast progression, definitely see a doctor, because sometimes there's challenges that can complicate the disease, or if you don't have the disease, some of these things can be the, ch the problem with somebody having uh, dementia symptoms. Some vitamin deficiencies can cause dementia, dementia symptoms and depression. And again, all of these things are treatable. So we need to take really good care of ourselves, notice what's happening, take, keep a log or a journal, write down when you start, if you start noticing some challenges in yourself or a family member or friend, keep a journal, write down what's happening and when is it happening, you know, and see a doctor to try and find out what's going on. And if they can't answer the question, keep gathering information and get another opinion because it's really difficult even for doctors to be able to diagnose in the early stages because you can see there, are, there could be many, many, many causes of those dementia symptoms.
So this shows you a sketch of a slice of the brain. If you would slice right through the brain, we have a normal slide of a healthy brain and an Alzheimer's brain. And as I mentioned, the brain cells will start to dissipate and the brain will actually start to shrink. And so down in the middle of the uh, back of the brain is our hippocampus, and that's where our, most of our memory brain cells are uh, stored. And so when those brain cells start to dissipate or go away, then you can't keep those memories. So when somebody is asking a question over and over again, the brain cells that are in charge of remembering that they just asked a question are not there. So they don't have the ability to remember that they just asked a question. But there are 100 billion brain cells, and many of the other brain cells are still working. Logic still works much longer than those ones that are keeping track of memories. So when they're asking a question, and then they ask it again, to us who don't have Alzheimer's, it's a new question. We should answer it like it's a new question. It's not that easy. And yet, that's the answer, is to be able to better understand that when somebody's doing that, they don't have the ability to know that they're doing it, but they still want the answer. So we need to still answer the question. And there are some strategies through more, through more education we can learn how to better help somebody be able to solve some of those challenges. So this is, so, this is some pet, these are some PET scan images. We have the normal brain PET scan and a light Alzheimer's brain. And so you can see they are able to identify the changes in uh, the activity in the brain. So when somebody is getting a diagnosis, it's pretty rare that they'll do the PET scans because they are able to get a diagnosis without doing the PET scans in most cases. And so when folks are doing, when the researchers are doing research studies, they more likely would do the PET scans, but it's not really a normal part of the diagnosis. However, through some of the research, they've been able to identify this is what the brain looks like in the beginning stage as a normal brain, and then as it progresses, the change in the activity in the brain. You can see it's smaller um, on the second slide as well. This is a very interesting comparison. We know that when Alzheimer's disease is happening, as it progresses, folks with the diagnosis seem to revert back to an earlier point in their life. They might believe that they're living in their life 20 or 40 or 60 years ago. So things that they learned as a child or as a teenager, they're gonna remember much longer than things that happened last week or last month or last year. And so this is an interesting comparison in late Alzheimer's the brain, what it looks like, and a normal infant's brain. And there are even some comparisons that as the stages of the progression happens, in those late stages, the cognitive ability is more like a teenager and then as a child and as an infant, the ability for people to be able to do the things that they can do. So in the initial stages, it starts with memory loss, which you know we can pretty much figure out how to manage that on a day-to-day -day basis. But as it progresses and it takes over more and more of the brain cells, then it, it you lose your ability to do more things like even speaking and eventually eating and breathing. So it is progressive and it is eventually fatal because it will continue to take over all of the functions of the brain. So this just slide just shows the continuum of the Alzheimer's disease. So again, in the early stages when that damage is, in, is happening, people can actually have Alzheimer's disease but they don't know it. So they're not symptomatic. And they've even done some studies to be able to identify when, they, when somebody does pass away and they do an autopsy, there have been people that had the plaques and tangles that many of you have heard about in the brain. They clearly had the biology of Alzheimer's disease, but they didn't have any symptoms. So they're doing a lot of research of why would that be. So somebody could have the damage happening for many years and not have any symptoms. And so they've been able to identify that people with higher levels of education are less symptomatic and it seems to move more slowly on average than those with less education. People who have a better diet have less progression in symptoms. So they've been able to identify there are many things we can do to reduce our risk, 
and perhaps delay the onset of symptoms. So if it's going to happen in me at age 75, let's say, but if I choose some really great healthy lifestyle choices, and I'll give you the list of some of those, then maybe I won't get, it in, get symptoms until I'm 80. So could I delay the onset five years? Would that be worth it? Well, absolutely. So a lot of the research is showing that we can reduce our risk or delay the symptoms, or even if I get a diagnosis, maybe slow down the progression. Some of our colleagues who have the diagnosis tell me that when they exercise, they feel better. And evidence is showing, even if you get a diagnosis, if you use regular, uh, the recommended amount of exercise, you know, 30 minutes a day, get your heart rate up a little bit. You don't have to become a marathon runner. Just pick it up on exercise. It can help you live better longer. So have a better quality of life and maybe slow down the progression of the disease. And so here's the 10 warning signs. So should you uh, notice any of these things, you should see a doctor. This means that somebody is starting to have some of the symptoms. And as I mentioned, the Alzheimer's disease, there's 5 million people with the diagnosis today in America. They're all different. It moves through the brain differently in every person. So this, they are going to come in different orders. There are some similarities in, in most people. However, it's going to be different in every person as well. So the first one is memory changes that disrupt daily life. So if you lose your keys and can't find them when it's time to walk out the door, that's going to be a normal age-related memory issue. You're going to all expect that to happen to you. As you age, that happens a little more often once we get a little older. We're busier. We're not paying attention. Our brain doesn't work as well as it should as we age, normal aging. But we could pay attention write things down, and just really be more focused. And that would help us be able to know or retrace our steps and know where our keys are. But if you lose your keys and you find them in some room that you were not in, you absolutely know you weren't in, because your brain cells have lost the ability to remember that you stopped there, that might be a symptom where it's more serious. So it's disrupting daily life. You can't retrace your steps. You need other people to help you remember things that you've always been able to remember before. So a change in memory that you've always been good at that's disrupting your life, that's a warning sign that you should see your doctor. Uh, the next one is challenges in planning or solving problems. Again, if you've always been good at doing those things, then it comes a day where that's more difficult or harder to do or taking a lot longer than before to do. So like balancing your checkbook, you've always been good at that, and then it comes a day, it doesn't even make sense how to do that. That's a warning sign that there's something more serious going on and you should see a doctor. Uh, the next one, difficulty completing familiar tasks. Again, things you've always been able to do. You can do the laundry, it makes sense, you've always been able to do that, and that's just one example, it might, might not be that for you, but it comes a day where it's like, I don't remember how to run the washing machine, it's the same washing machine, what, what's going on here? That's a warning sign that something more serious could be going on. Confusion with time and place. Let's say you come to this auditorium regularly, and then it comes a day where you look around and you think, I don't know where I am. I'm lost. It's a familiar place, but the brain cells in charge of this memory of where I am are broken. So that would be a warning sign that something is going on with your brain. Trouble understanding visual images and spatial relationships. So vision changes as the disease progresses. And the first one is our peripheral vision. We can see things pretty well from the sides uh, as we're younger. And as we age, that vision view narrows. That happens for all of us. But with Alzheimer's disease, it increases more drastically. So folks with the disease can only see a smaller area around them. So it'll be important that you make eye contact before you start talking to somebody with Alzheimer's disease, that you, that you get at eye level. If they're seating, sit next to them so they can see you. Somebody with Alzheimer's disease, as it progresses, can't see maybe the food right in front of them, but they can see their neighbor's food, so they might start eating food off their neighbor's plate because it's in their vision field. So those changes can be very confusing for family members because it's right there, but 
they can't see it. Even though you can see it, they can't see it. So those are warning signs that we need to see a doctor and understanding the symptoms can help you be a better caregiver. Um, new problems with words in speaking or writing. So in the early stages, folks start losing a few words and as it progresses, we understand that in those early stages, folks might learn one in, lose one in seven words. By middle, it's about half of their words and by the later stages, they lose the ability to use their words and their behaviors become their communication. And the interesting thing about this symptom is that sometimes people can sing when they can no longer speak because the music in the brain is a different area than the, the words. And so people can sometimes sing when they can't speak anymore. So it's a way to connect and be engaged in the community and in their community if they can continue to participate. Uh, misplacing things and losing the ability to retrace your steps. We talked about this one a little bit. Decreased or poor judgment. And so this is a symptom where we all have rules of life of what's okay and what's not okay in our life about how much money I should give to a charity or a telemarketer, don't give money to at all. And yet people with Alzheimer's disease can be talked into things much more easily. This is a symptom we certainly need to be aware of so that we can provide some safety uh, to, and protect those people that they don't get taken advantage of. And the next two I consider the symptom of the symptoms. If any of these things are happening, we certainly would withdraw more from work or social activities. Life it gets a little more confusing because people are going to look at me a little differently when my, I keep repeating the same story. And they don't know what to say, so I know something is wrong, but I don't know what it is. And I'm certainly going to be agitated and frustrated and I'm going to have a, a little bit different personality if I'm confused because people around me are confused because life is different. And so better understanding the symptoms can help us deal with that because we want to stay engaged in the community. That's one of the best things we can do to help live well, even though we might have a diagnosis, is to stay socially engaged. And so it's important to have really good communication. That's the best way to care for somebody. A social connection is critical for all people. As we age, staying social can help our, us improve our health care. And it's even more important with those with dementia. So we certainly need to stay connected in the community. And we certainly need to invite those with dementia or another uh, of any kind to share their stories. We all like to talk about our life and, and what we love, and it's even more important when somebody has dementia, is to talk about and share those stories. Uh, some of the communication barriers are if people get isolated, they lose their ability, their options to stay connected. They um, might be ignored or, you know, people go to the doctor when they have dementia and the doctors start talking to their caregiver and they're sitting right there and many times they're still able to participate and yet they start talking to their caregiver. We need to still talk to the person with dementia even if it looks like they can't participate in the discussion, we need to give them that opportunity. The elder speak is sometimes we think we need to change how we talk to elders, and it can be very uh, disrespectful. And so using baby talk or terms of endearment like honey or sweetie or calling somebody grandma when they're not your grandma is, is really disrespectful, and we need to honor and cherish those elders as the respectful, wonderful people that they are, and this can be challenging for folks when they have, even more when they have dementia. We need to have meaningful interactions, and so we should ask them what is meaningful. When somebody gets a diagnosis of dementia, we need to find out what is it that they love, what's really important to them. You know, we all choose and live our lives the way we, the way we want to, and we get to decide that we still need that if we have dementia. So we need to ask them what really matters to them. You know, when, they, when it's time to get ready to go to bed, you know, do you want, do you want uh, extra pajamas and a robe? Or, you know, do you want uh, just sleep in a t-shirt? Or do you need to take a shower before you go to bed? Or, you know, what do you like? Do you want the TV on or do you want it off? All of that information is important to all of us. And it's even more important that we find that out while somebody still can share that kind of information. We need to address them by name. 
and certainly not call them sweetie or honey. Find out their name and call them by name. We all like to be, be called by our own name. I introduce yourself, get at eye level. Again, they need to be able to see you and connect with them uh, that way. Sometimes folks with Alzheimer's disease have challenging behaviors. And typically what that means is something is wrong. It's either physically or emotionally, something is getting in the way, and they don't have the ability to tell you what is wrong. And I have to tell you, if I have to go to the bathroom and I can't tell you that I do, and an hour later I still have to go, my behaviors are gonna be pretty challenging and I bet yours will too. And so something is wrong if there's difficult or challenging behaviors. So our job as caregivers and family members is to figure out what's wrong. They give us clues, we need to put on our detective hat and find out what is really wrong. Uh, so some of the challenging behaviors are a way to communicate. It's their only way to tell you something is getting in the way. They might, folks might be irritable or anxious or depressed. Uh, they might have sleep changes, physical or verbal outbursts, emotional distress. Again, something is wrong if any of these things are happening. They typically don't need medication. We need to figure out what's wrong, eliminate that, and those behaviors will go away. And so these are, again, some more challenges of the, or causes of the behavior challenges. Pain is an important one. If somebody has pain and they have dementia, the brain cells aren't working, and so we're not communicating with the, the brain on where that pain is, and yet they're still in pain. And so that's, again, something that can be treated, and if we can figure out where the pain is and treat that, then uh, the behavioral challenges will, be, will go away. Folks with dementia need a smaller world so they can get overstimulated from a busy or loud environment. So uh, around the holidays, it's really fun to go to all those big, wonderful family events, and yet that could be overstimulation, could be more overwhelming than it's worth. Uh, when you visit somebody in a, in a nursing home, if there's a lot of radios and TVs going on, it can be really overwhelming. If you want to have a conversation with somebody with dementia, shut off all the extra distraction and noise. Find a quieter, smaller space, because you can pay better attention, and you can have a better conversation, because that overstimulation is too much, and they can't handle it. Unfamiliar surroundings, and yet something that has always been familiar could become an unfamiliar surroundings. We need to stay connected to what's familiar. It, it helps all of us. And with, the, with dementia, sometimes that causes more challenges if people feel like they're in an unfamiliar, confusing surrounding. Loneliness and boredom, pretty awful for anybody. And it certainly happens with people with dementia. So does it matter? Do we still need to go visit grandma if she can't remember my name anymore? Yes, we still need to go visit because she's still there. She still can connect. We need to find a different way to connect. And so she's going to get more distressed if we don't visit and provide some way to connect and so that we can overcome that loneliness or boredom. Folks will have difficulty with activities or chores. They still need to do them. You know, if mom can't set the table like she used to and we decide we're going to do that for her, she can't cook anymore, we're going to hire a service, she can't clean anymore, we're going to hire somebody to come in and do that, We've taken away her life's work, and now she's going to be bored because she doesn't have anything to do. We need to give her back things to do. Even though she can't do it as well as she used to, she still needs meaning and purpose in her life. And so we might need to adapt and change how we do things, and it needs to just be okay that it's not as perfect as it used to be. She still needs to get to participate because that's gonna cause the behavioral challenges if she doesn't have something to do. So folks can have more feelings of anger or worry or fear or frustration, because they can't make sense about why can't I live my life and have my choices on what I wanna do anymore. We take that away from them. Well, we need to give it back, give them meaningful activities, something to do, something that matters to them. And the way to find out what matters to them is to find out early, when they have those early symptoms, what really matters. Is it art or music or just being able to set the table myself? 
I need to be in control of some decisions. We need to simplify them. We shouldn't ask them, what do you want for dinner today? Because there's an infinite number of answers. We need to ask, do you want a burger? Do you want macaroni and cheese? So smaller options simplifies things, but they still get a choice. We need to understand the behaviors, and here's some just tips on how to figure that out, is what happened just before the behavior happened? Sometimes there's triggers that cause those challenge. How frequently does the behavior occur? So these are just some tips to be able to narrow that down and try and figure out some ideas of what do we do if you see some behaviors that are a little bit different or confusing. We can find many ways to respond, and so that's one way you can learn more is the Alzheimer's Association gives people tips. We have an 800 number that you can call anytime, 24-7, to be able to ask, this is happening, what do I do? And we have licensed social workers on staff. Or ask your doctor or the social worker where you, where you see a doctor, and they can help you try and find solutions to find ways to respond. You don't have to just say, there's nothing I can do, I don't understand. Be, being able to learn more about the symptoms and what you can do about it can help improve the quality of life for both the person with the diagnosis and their care partners. This is the best thing I've learned since I've been with the association is that emotional memory matters and it lingers. And so this is a quote from Maya Angelou. She says that I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. Well, this is even more important when people have Alzheimer's disease or another dementia. Emotional memory is not lost with this memory, with this memory loss, with this disease. While a person with dementia will lose cognitive memory, they will not lose how you make them feel. So they might not remember that you visited, but they remember somebody visited and I feel good and that will linger. So that matters. Emotional memory also matters that they remember the icky ones, too. So if you have an argument, they're going to remember something icky happened. The negative emotions will linger, too. So if that happens, it's even more important to stop, walk out of the room, adjust your attitude, put your smile back on your face, and come back and try again. Because they're going to remember how you make them feel. So connect in that positive way. Create moments of joy. And if, you're, if things aren't working, stop, readjust, start again, and come back and have a more positive experience. Well, that's the end of our slides, but I wanted to open it up to questions um, from the group. We have information uh, out in the hallway. We, uh, the Alzheimer's Association has a variety of educational materials, and so there's some handouts available out in the entryway, and our 800 number is on all of the uh, materials out there. If you want to contact with our local office in the Des Moines area, you can call the 800 number and leave them a message, and, and I'll get it, and I'll call you back. And so, George? Susan, I'll ask a question. And um, we have one up in the back as well. Oh, very good. Didn't notice. Let's go with that person first. Yes. So the question is, if somebody is, as they start having some more of the symptoms, should you contact a family member or should you continue to visit them independently and not involve the family? Well, so, the, so is it a violation? Well, I would do both and. You know, you're honoring the, the friend and, and ask them, is it okay if I connect with your family? You know, we want increasing the team of care is a great solution of more family and more friends and connecting as a whole community is going to help them have a better quality of life and enhance your participation in that as well. So first I would ask them, does she acknowledge that she has dementia? Okay. 
not with you. And so it's also it's continuing to ask. You can mention to her, you know, you can bring it up and ask if she wants to talk about it. You can say, I, I've noticed some challenges in how things are going sometimes. You know, are, are, are you doing okay? I mean, we can ask each other. It's a way for us to care about them if we ask. Is there, you know, I've noticed, give some specific examples. And then, or maybe you don't want to talk about the dementia and you, you say, how's your family? You know, I'd love to connect with them too. Is that okay with you? You know, for, you know, however you can connect and use some strategies to be able to continue to increase the communication and visit. Because the worst thing you could do is stop visiting. Stay visiting and, you know, just feel it around and try and see if you can get more information. Most of the time, they want to talk about it. And that will increase the awareness and concern. One of the uh, information uh, presentations that we do is conversations about dementia. Through our website, you can find talking points about how to go to the doctor when they don't want to go, driving, those kinds of things. So you can go to our website and find talking points of, you know, how do you bring up this topic? And that's another thing you could call the 800 number and they will give you other suggestions too because you're not the first person who's had this challenge. Everybody, it, everybody's going through this across the country, five million people. And so we need to share that information of how you have those interactions and continue to increase that quality of life and, and not get isolated, stay involved in the community. That's a great question. Yes? Not necessarily. So Alzheimer's disease, these are not all Alzheimer's disease. There are 80 different kinds of diseases, just 70% of the time it's Alzheimer's. So 30% of the time it's something else, some other kind of dementia. And so, and so it's important to learn which symptoms they're having. Because if somebody has Lewy body dementia, they're not gonna have memory loss. So you're gonna have a little different strategy to talk to them than somebody with Alzheimer's disease who has memory loss. So let me give you an example of why that matters. So let's say mom has Alzheimer's disease and she says something like, her mom, your grandmother's coming to visit. Well, she passed away a really long time ago. You don't want to tell her that because she's forgotten that her mom passed away. But what she's really asking for, she wants to celebrate and connect with her mom. So you talk about her mom. You don't say, mom died, grandma died. You say, hey, tell me about her. She is such, she, I really love talking about her. Tell me more about her. And so, you, you know, it's like therapeutic lies. You gotta be careful with those, even with Alzheimer's, but you don't wanna tell therape therapeutic fibs or lies to somebody with another kind of dementia, like Lewy body, who doesn't have memory loss because now you've completely lost trust from the person who really can remember things and now you're just messing with them. So you gotta understand the symptoms and the situation to know at what point, you know, what do you do to keep somebody safe? Sometimes you have to kind of stretch the truth a little bit. But if they know you're doing that, you're gonna completely lose trust. So really understanding the symptoms of the disease, the kind of dementia they have is helpful so that you can better communicate and increase that quality of life without and, and keep them safe. If somebody wants to go outside because they think it's not cold and it's really cold and they don't want to put on a coat, you can't let them. And yet, you know, how do you negotiate your way through that? So knowing the symptoms makes a big difference. So the question is, when you get a diagnosis, will the doctor be able to tell you? Well, when the doctor first gives a diagnosis, many times they don't know yet which one it is. And so the progression happens. So the family is going to know more. People close to the person are going to know more about what symptoms they are. And then it's going to be important to learn, OK, if it's, we think it's Alzheimer's, here's what's happening. And so you write down all of the symptoms. 
and find out what do you do about that. And so effective communication is one of the education programs that we, do, we provide. Again, that's why it's important to know which symptoms and which interventions are gonna work with this person. It's gonna be different in every, in every one. So incredibly challenging to know and keeping that journal or log will help. Because hindsight's great. It's like, when this happened, what else was going on? You know, was it, you know, was it only when Uncle Bob comes to visit, she's in a bad mood? Well, what's Uncle Bob doing that's creating that trigger? Or, you know, is it when this dog's around and maybe they've got a memory of a bad experience with a dog? So it's writing down what else is going on and then, you know, becoming a detective to narrow down what the triggers are to identify what the, what the interventions are. It's, it's not an easy intervention, and yet it's the best we have. There's no pill that will make these symptoms go away, unfortunately. They're still working very hard and they're making progress, but no treatment or cure today. Yeah. Questions? Yes. <clears throat> So the question is it, uh, about in the nursing home, they seem to be increasing the Xanax when there's anxiety in your mother-in-law. And should you get to the bottom of why? Should you talk to them? Yes. Uh, there's information about uh, non-medication uh, interventions that are they're really trying to re reduce the kind of medications they're providing in, at home and in nursing homes. So, Yes, trying to find out what's causing the anxiety is a better solution most of the time. I mean, there could be a very good reason, and there, it could be the answer in this case that could still be the best solution. I, I'm, I'm not a doctor, and so it's important to get all the information you can. But there's more information available about, about what you do instead of, pro, of adding more medications when somebody's anxious or showing more anxiety. So we can get you more information about where do you find those answers. Good question. Another question over here? So the question is that you have a family member with many symptoms and could they have more than one kind and what else can you do? And so yes, you can have more than one kind um, and you should definitely talk to the medical professional since she's in, in already in a facility, yes. Um, and what do they know? You, we absolutely need to work with the professionals who work in the facilities and find out more, but asking more questions and asking what else we can do is a very important uh, family responsibility to do what they can. So uh, in your specific case, definitely talk to the professional so she's already seeing a, a doctor. You can also call the association and talk to one of the licensed social workers on staff and with specific questions and they may be helpful. So I, so the, okay. So the question is, it, is it common for a medical professional to just say it's a UTI? And I wouldn't have the answer to that. I, but if you're, anybody who's concerned about an answer you get from a doctor and you want to get a second opinion, absolutely. And we, we can help with additional uh, organizations that provide additional medical care. So ask more questions, and if you're concerned, uh, seek an, another second opinion. So are there more questions? There's one here.
Okay, so the question is about, you have a family history of Alzheimer's at a younger onset, and are there counseling, are there, um, genetic counseling available? Yes, uh, there are genetic counselors. They can do some testing. In some cases, they are able to identify if it is specifically genetic or not. In some cases, they still are not able to, but a genetic counselor can then help you look at all of the pros and cons of getting that genetic testing to identify whether it's right for you and your family, because every situation is gonna be a little bit different. You know, I don't know of the genetic counselors here. We'd certainly contact your doctor, but I'll make a note and see if we can find that out. If you wanna share your contact information on my sign-in sheet on, my, on the Alzheimer's table, I'll get back to you on that one. Because I'm not, I'm not familiar with genetic counseling, but I, I would guess it's available in Iowa, but I don't know the names of specific ones. So I'll, see, I'll do some research on that. Are there other questions? Well, let's, let's thank Susan for giving, sharing her knowledge here today. Thank you. <clears throat> Remember, we have some other uh, productions coming the uh, subsequent Tuesday. So we'll see you here. Tell your friends. Thanks for coming. Lots of questions. I th if you're a student and you didn't check in, can you do so on your way out? Thank you. The evaluation forms can also just be returned to this table right here. <laughs>